Good morning, everyone. Happy Super Tuesday. Uh, my name is Joseph Borelli. I'm the chair of the Fire and Emergency Management Committee. Today, we'll review the fire department and not New York City Emergency Management's fiscal 2021 budgets and relevant sections of the preliminary mayor's management report for FY 2020 to understand how they address the needs of all New Yorkers. The fire department's fiscal 2021 preliminary budget totals 2.1 billion uh, with 17,582 positions. Uh, the budget includes minimal changes of the uh, 42.7 million in fiscal 2020 and 3.6 million in fiscal 21. Of this amount, new needs totals 3.5 million in fiscal 2020 and 2.6 million in the out years to support 36 new positions. Most notably, funding adds 16 new positions for the fire prevention unit for fire inspectors and trainers and nine positions for EMS to support the city's criminal justice reform efforts for discovery. The fire department's fiscal 2020 to 2024 capital commitment plan totals 977 million and supports 297 unique projects. While the adopted fiscal 2020 budget did add new funding of 38.1 million for FY 2020 and 48.3 million for FY 2021 to dozens of projects, it remains a concern of this committee that many other budget and programmatic priorities raised last year have not been addressed. Hudson Yards, which opened almost a year ago, is still without a firehouse, stretching the resources of the neighboring firehouses and EMS stations. Staten Island does not have a third EMS station, and building one is not at the top of the department's list of priorities. The diversity of the department still lags behind other uniform agencies and the makeup of the city as a whole. EMS workers notably earn far less than other first responders while also handling an increasingly larger volume call. While overtime has attempted to be right-sized, we have to address increasing overtime spending. Lastly, we have to assess the need for additional fire and EMS resources throughout the city to decrease rising response time and continue to look at how best to improve EMS operations through expense and capital budgets. The committee held oversight hearings on various topics last year, EMS attrition, the posting of hurricane evacuation zone and multiple dwelling units, the city's next generation 911 system, and we recently held an oversight hearing on innovative and technological advances to improve FDNY EMS emergency response times. As the city experiences substantial increases in call volumes for medical emergencies from one year to the next, the department has added additional EMS positions for fiscal 2021, but has not addressed the capital needs to adequately support the growing demands for EMS services. I am interested to see in how the budget also addresses those needs because increases in call volume for medical emergencies and the growth of Hudson Yards neighborhood has brought different challenges. And I want to make sure our communities are adequately served and our firefighters and EMS staff have the resources to meet and adapt to the growing demand and changes. The committee would like to know what the department plans to do to address these deficiencies as well as an update on the department's recruiting plan, a funding increase for emergency medical technicians, adding a new EMS station on Staten Island, and the new needs that were adopted, uh, added at adoption in the fiscal 2021 preliminary budget. I would ask our committee, I would thank our committee staff for their hard work. Finance analyst Jack Kern, he's the handsome uh, chap next to me. Unit head Isha Wright, I think she's somewhere. Uh, Josh Kingsley, this, this uh, old fella next to me. Uh, policy uh, analyst Will Hongach, and my chief of staff Frank Mascia. I'd like to welcome and thank Commissioner Nigro, as we always do, and our firefighters, EMTs, paramedics, and the department's civilian staff for the work that they do. I'm looking forward to hearing from the commissioner, and uh, Josh, if you will swear them in. Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in testimony before this committee, and to answer council member questions honestly? I do. Now please state your name for the record, all of you, and then go ahead. Thank you. Dan Nigro, fire commissioner. Laura Cavanaugh, first deputy commissioner. John Sudden, chief of department. Steve Rush, Fire Department Budget. Nafisa Noonan, Recruitment and Retention, Assistant Commissioner. Thank you guys, uh, all of you, and please uh, begin. Okay, good morning, Chair Borelli. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today about the preliminary budget for fiscal year 2021 for the Fire Department. Uh, as you heard, I'm joined this morning by Laura Cavanaugh, John Sudnick, Steve Rush, and Nafisha Noonan. I'm pleased to report that fire deaths in the city of New York in 2019 were down 25 percent. There were a total of 66 civilian fire deaths last year, 
And while even a single death is one too many, we are encouraged by this reduction. This outstanding achievement is the result of the brave service of FDNY members working together to remove those trapped by fire, providing unrivaled emergency medical care, thoroughly investigating fires, educating the public, and inspecting buildings and areas of public assembly throughout the city to ensure the safety of the people whom we serve. In New York City, we have now experienced a trend of 14 consecutive years with fewer than 100 fire deaths. We continue to build on that success. At the fire department, an incident is designated a serious fire when it escalates to the point of requiring a full all-hands assignment or higher, consisting of a dozen fire units that respond, conduct search and rescue operations, and extinguish the fire. We experienced 3% fewer serious fires in 2019 than we did in 2018, and overall, we've seen a reduction in serious fires of 24% over the last five years. Fewer serious fires than in the past years is obviously a positive development. However, the number of calls that we received for medical emergency are trending in the opposite direction. In 2019, the fire department received approximately 564,000 calls for life-threatening medical emergencies, approximately 968,000 calls for non-life-threatening medical incidents. This total, nearly 1,532,000 medical calls, represents the highest number that the department has ever received. Remarkably, this is the fifth year in a row that we have broken a new record for medical call volume. Our members are as busy as they have ever been. With our emergency incident count as high as it is, it's more important than ever that we leverage additional tools to help keep the city safe. One way that we accomplish this is through our expanded outreach to members of the community. The more we're able to educate our neighbors before they find themselves in times of trouble, the less likely they are to experience emergencies and the safer they will be when they do. The Fire Department's Community Affairs Unit conducts fire safety education demonstrations and CPR instruction seminars in communities throughout the five boroughs. By partnering with community groups, elected officials, schools, senior centers, and our fellow city agencies, in 2019, the Fire Safety Education Unit coordinated or participated in more than 7,500 education events reaching nearly 600,000 New Yorkers. When a neighborhood experiences a fatal fire, members of the Fire Safety Education Unit respond to provide educational information to residents and sign them up for smoke alarm installations. We are also in the midst of a several years long smoke alarm distribution installation campaign with our partners in the American Red Cross. We meet New Yorkers at a variety of community events and sign them up for installations, and we conduct targeted door-to-door -door campaigns in neighborhoods where the need is the greatest. Between May 2015 and December of 2019, we visited 35,000 homes, installed 100,000 alarms, and distributed another 90,000. One popular facet of our outreach is our summer block parties where we distribute fire safety information, train attendees in CPR, and sign up residents for fire alarm installation. In 2019, nearly 6,000 people attended a fire department block party. We also distributed more than 62,000 alarm batteries, and we gave fire safety presentations to more than 316,000 students at New York City schools. The unit provided CPR training to more than 18,000 high school students and nearly 28,000 trainees in total. We partnered with the Department of the Aging to conduct fire safety workshops geared toward seniors at 87 locations. We worked with the Department of Youth and Community Development, resulting in over 2,500 K through 5 students from the Beacon After School programs attending an open house at their local firehouse. This is the second year that we've done the program with DYCD, and we like that not only do the students learn about fire safety, but it gives them a small sense of what it might be like 
to pursue a career in the fire department. We conducted fire safety trainings for clergy members, preparing them to serve as ambassadors to spread fire safety talking points to their communities, and fire safety education teams and American Red Cross partners visited houses of worship to sign up congregants for fire alarm installations. We similarly worked with the Administration of Child Services, training 2,300 frontline child welfare staff so that they know to keep an eye out for potential fire hazards in the home and refer the families they are working with for smoke alarm installation at no charge to the family. The FDNY also had a very successful year in advancing another of our priorities, the department's commitment to cultivating and sustaining a work environment that embraces diversity, equity, and inclusion. The Bureau of Diversity and Inclusion was incredibly active in 2019, engineering a wide variety of inward and outward facing programming and training. We hosted several community engagement events. A small sampling of those events included an event honoring FDNY women during Women's History Month, the department's first Holocaust Remembrance Day event, an Asian Pacific American Heritage Month celebration, Hanukkah celebrations, a six principles of nonviolence talk in honor of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., two Black History Month events at headquarters, our third annual Women to Women Summit, our fourth annual LGBTQ Pride celebration, and celebrating a variety of Hispanic and Latinx cultural initiatives. Our members also took part in a number of parades, including the World Pride Parade, the Veterans Day Parade, Celebrate Israel Day Parade, the Philippine Independence Day Parade, the Puerto Rican Day Parade, the Lunar New Year Parade, and a large number of other parades celebrating the diversity of our great city. The Bureau of Diversity and Inclusion was also responsible for a large number of internal initiatives in 2019. We distribute on a quarterly basis two internal publications devoted to diversity and inclusion best practices and we rolled out a full multimedia campaign highlighting messaging and tips on contributing to an inclusive culture using posters, screensavers, kiosk displays, videos, and brochures. The Diversity Inclusion Unit worked with the FDNY EEO office to train uniform members and civilians in unconscious bias, LGBTQ discrimination, sexual harassment, EEO issues, emotional intelligence, religious diversity, as well as conducting individual meetings at firehouses to discuss diversity and inclusion. We also continued educational meetings with the department's 40 firefighter EMS and civilian affiliated organizations to better support diversity and inclusion objectives and to foster a more positive work environment. As we state in our diversity and inclusion vision, the excellence of the New York City Fire Department is enhanced by the ability to recruit, hire, retain, and promote highly skilled, talented, and motivated members from diverse backgrounds. As I have testified to the Council previously, the Department put a great deal of resources into our firefighter recruitment campaign for the most recent open competitive exam. The campaign was very successful in recruiting a diverse pool of candidates. 56% of test takers were non-white and 9% were female. We know that there is still much more work to do, but our progress is encouraging. In 2019, we began to see the fruits of that labor. In September, we graduated the first full class of probationary firefighters from the current civil service list. The composition of the class represented the growing diversity of our department including 37% individuals identifying as people of color, 12% black graduates, 20% Latin graduates, and 5% Asian graduates, and 120 veterans. Among this outstanding group of graduates were 16 women, the second largest group of women in a probationary firefighter class in FDNY history. I can now proudly say that for the first time, more than 100 women serve as firefighters and fire officers in that department, and that number will only continue to grow. We have many classes from this list to go, 
and we anticipate that our department will continue growing more diverse with each class. I am passionate about recruiting new members to join the department because it is such an incredible honor to serve the people and the communities of New York. I'd be happy to take your questions at this time. Thank you, and uh, just a, a point for the record, we're joined by council member uh, Justin Brannon, and also um, there was a last minute change for this committee hearing. The, uh, the Office of Emergency Management will not be testifying today. Uh, the commissioner and her staff uh, were involved with uh, important meetings regarding the, uh, the coronavirus, COVID-19, uh, so we will be rescheduling them to a later date, so stay tuned. Um, Commissioner, thank you very much. So just the question we start off with every year, were there any new needs that the department requested from OMB uh, but were not granted? Well, I'll, I'll start by saying over the past six years, uh, thank this administration, the council, uh, have been very good to the fire department and the fire department has, has done very well. I think this year has been very tight for all agencies in the city, as we know, with the budget. Uh, the department had no um, big asks that were not uh, fulfilled. We've had a few smaller ones of staffing in uh, either in the technical fields or in fire prevention. We're still working with OMB on some of those, so we're hopeful. But I don't think uh, any of our uh, critical needs were not met uh, either in previous budgets or in this one. Are there any self-funded, uh, meaning uh, the budget coming entirely within the department, uh, pilot programs or any programs that you feel uh, need additional need despite of uh, the mayor's budget targets? Well, I think that the department is always looking, is piloting various things and as they become, as they leave the pilot stage and we, we come to the conclusion with some of them that they would benefit the department, we will certainly uh, put in subsequent requests for those things. Um, as part of the FY 2020 PEG program, there was a hiring freeze uh, involving 54 positions. Um, was the department able to achieve the PEG? Was it, was it handled? Um, the 54 position target has been met largely through administrative and support positions. Those are positions that were vacant and were subsequently eliminated. So just to, as a share of the breakdown, almost all administrative? That's correct. And was there any uh, uh, staffing or operational problems as a result? Obviously there's always challenges. You'd always like to have your full head count, but the, the department has had vacancies in these areas for quite some time, so we're, we're dealing with the issues. There might be a little bit more of the civilian overtime area, but in general we're able to address the, the needs uh, from the different bureaus. So the November and the preliminary financial plans added funding and headcount to the fire prevention uh, office with uh, equaling 1.1 million. Uh, this was for 16 new inspector and trainer positions uh, and uh, seven new sprinkler and standpipe inspector positions. Can you go into some detail why those are needed uh, and what specifically we hope to accomplish by adding those? I think it's a good thing. I want to say I think this is something right. we've been so, hoping for for a while. So there's three areas I believe in fire prevention where we added positions. The training area is one area in particular of which we were uh, really, um, um, pushing with OMB and OMB agreed to it was because we're training larger classes and we need to have a larger um, training academy for fire prevention, which is rather small. So that was, a, that was very helpful to us. Sprinkler standpipe, those are inspections that are conducted every five years. They're witness tests um, with plumbing, uh, uh, plumbers on, on site and our inspectors. Uh, however, there is a backlog in those areas. So by having additional sprinkler standpipe inspectors available, we can reduce and get that backlog um, under control. And the last area is one of the areas that is always gains the most attention. That's in fire alarm unit. There's a lot of um, pressures from the construction and real estate industry for us to do those plan reviews and those inspections. And so we've added staff there as well for inspections. Um, so I, I'm an opponent of the state's uh, criminal justice reform involving bail reform. So can you just go into uh, what the 540,000 in 2020 and the new 617,000 uh, is needed in outlying years to comply with that law? 
like um, many other agencies that are involved in violations issuance, in particular summonses, these are more serious violations that will be adjudicated in criminal court. The fire department has an enforcement unit under the legal division that works with the law department on these cases. Now, the new law requires a certain expedited turnaround of information to defendants, otherwise cases are dismissed. So within the, the, the legal division, we added additional staff to handle that workload. Um, we also initially have uh, added in, we, we thought we would be adding in computer titles um, to do the programming associated with that, but we found an alternative option that we are putting in place, which uh, would a uh, requirements contract vendor that the city uses to do the, the scanning of all the records, to digitize them so they could be available uh, for both the lawyers to review and then the law department to review subsequently. So this is about getting the information to the law department more what, what expeditiously. What was the turnaround time for discovery now uh, with the department's uh, legal department? I, Were I they chronically delayed or anything? No, I think the new law requires a, an expedited turnaround, um, so we didn't have the resources to address the expedited turnaround. If the department had its choice, would it rather the 617,000 in fire alarm inspectors or, you know, gophers to go find uh, discovery documents? Well, obviously the new law requires us to do that. Otherwise, cases that we are, in a sense, prosecuting for fire code violations would be dismissed, and we think that's a serious issue for us. Yeah, you're right. You're, you're right about that. Um, is this funding sufficient or is this sort of a baseline for now and we'll see how it goes and we might have to add to it if we still can't comply? We may need to add, add to it in the area of fire prevention. We're having discussions with OMB on that right now. Um, but those, uh, you know, as of now, we are working together with the legal division of fire prevention to address the needs of the law department. Um, the FY 2020 mayor's management report um, the goal was to respond to medical emergencies lowering the response time the uh, current preliminary MMR uh, and I think we have the on screen we're a multimedia committee now isn't that fantastic um, three critical indicators of the FDNY related to responding to these emergencies have increased since FY 2017 including the FY 2020 four month reporting period can you just go over the reasons for this uh, increase and, and what the department's doing? I think there's two basic reasons for it. As, as I testified, um, the number of calls we received con has continued to grow from FY15 to FY20, and the city be has become more and more congested, more and more difficult to get around for our units. But I do think the... Um, the bottom line, as far as the department, while response time is, a, is an important measure, the mission of the department, of course, is to save lives, save property. Uh, serious fires are down, fire deaths are down. Uh, the people of our city are treated, um, have the best possible EMTs and paramedics, the best of any, any place in our country, and anyone that calls why do so many people call? People ask me, why in New York do more people call 911 for medical help than anywhere else? Perhaps because they know that they will get good treatment here, that they know that people will arrive and treat them with respect and treat them um, to the best possible outcome. So I think the department, despite the difficulty in us getting around, despite the increase in calls, has been able to meet and exceed really the public's expectation. So I, I think you're 100% you're right to tout the uh, increasing rates of survivability, and I think you're right to credit the, uh, the folks that are on the ground uh, providing the service. Um, but, but, you know, frankly, w when the response time's lower, we, we also tout those as, as good uh, metrics to measure our success, and when they go up, I think we should also acknowledge them. Do you think that um, adding to the department's fleet diversity of vehicles uh, could possibly address some of the response times in certain unique neighborhoods or uh, buildings or areas? I think there are <clears throat> places where that works, you know, and I, uh, I can, uh, 
We have an ASAP vehicle, you know, in Times Square. We, Successfully. We, we've Preventive. used that, yes. We've used it in Hudson Yards. We used it around Rockefeller Center um, during the tree lighting season. Um, there are places, I think, for those uh, types of approaches to both um, medical calls and other types of emergency calls, and the department has used it. We did place uh, rapid response fire vehicles at the Hudson Yards location when they opened last year. Um, found there to be really no, no call for it, but um, there are places where that can be used also and where the department successfully uses um, alternate type vehicles to meet the needs. So growing that is certainly in our future. Do, do you think, you know, d despite my best efforts as a, a car uh, enthusiast, and I know people hate me for that, um, but we seem to be pedestrianizing more and more public space uh, in New York City. Um, do you think this need for sort of smaller, more uh, shiftier vehicles be, be just expands over time, given the direction of the city? Again, I think there are specific locations that that may work. I don't think uh, as a, um, the workhorse, so to speak, of our either our fire or an EMS system will ever be something of that nature. But uh, locations, Penn Station, Grand Central Station, uh, those types of places, places where we use them in uh, Central Park, say, or uh, the beaches in the summer where we use alternate vehicles, yes. Have you ever rode a Segway? I have never ridden a Segway. Neither have I. I think we should, uh, I think we should maybe do our first test together. Maybe we should. I, I'm, I'm like you. I'm a car enthusiast, mm -hmm. and uh, but I'm willing to try it. Good, good. Um, I just want to ask you a question about uh, COVID-19. Are operators have they received any instruction? Are uh, first responders have they received any instruction on symptoms and uh, screening for potential COVID-19? Certainly. Uh, for the past month, we've been using a protocol where. Uh, People calling for medical help are asked simple questions, cough, fever, travel. Um, this is something we've used before in other cri medical crises that is, uh, gives our folks an alert that if they are, if people are reporting these things, uh, our units going into the scene will know in advance. Um, we have been, you know, REMTs and paramedics have been treating people with infectious conditions for uh, decades have more experience than anybody in the probably in the world in successfully doing that so I think we're uh, we have alerted them we will do more of that we will continue to do it uh, probably on a daily basis while this crisis uh, continues in our city and in our country so switching gears to uh, Hudson Yards for a second um, it's now open and at last year's hearing, uh, you had stated that the department didn't anticipate a serious uptick in calls, um, but, but perhaps in fire calls, but some degree of emergency and medical call increases. Uh, so what was the case of uh, the units that are the responding units to Hudson Yards? Was there an increase or what were the statistics? There was really no increase in fire and em emergency calls, very minimal increase, nothing that would um uh, put us in serious jeopardy, and a slight increase in medical calls, but nothing, uh, any increase, of course, taxes our ability, but not seriously. Is, is the need for a firehouse and the EMS station or both uh, still a, a desire of the department, or is this something that was somewhat overblown and perhaps it didn't need to actually occur? I think we're still evaluating some additional form of uh, fire protection in the future, and uh, we're looking at locations for a station. I think do we have for expansion in the west side of Manhattan? There, there were, in conjunction with um, DCAS, we've been looking primarily first um, for some needs related to rescue one and a new firehouse there because that facility is um, 
undersized. Um, and we were also looking at potentially another EMS station, but these are very preliminary. And as you know, real estate in that particular area of the city is quite a challenging um, aspect of trying to locate space. Since Hudson Yards has a tax abatement, is there any leverage that uh, you're aware of that the city could use to uh, perhaps have an easier time getting space? I think perhaps that ship has sailed, certainly in the uh, east portion of Hudson Yards, which is completed. Um, I agree with you. Um, Staten Island's EMS station, uh, however, uh, has the FDNY reassessed the need for a third EMS station on Staten Island? I don't think at the, at the present time the department has requested an additional station on Staten Island. Do, do you think it's in need? Is, is it on a priority list, maybe not the top one? or? Well, I know right now Staten Island, um, I believe, has our best response time of any borough um, for EMS. I think if we continue to monitor it and if we see that there is a need, as we saw with the uh, squad company, a need for a squad company on Staten Island, the department will request it. But at the present time, we have no plans to request an uh, additional station on Staten Island. In uh, FY18, uh, one third of the department's ambulance tours were privately run, and I believe that percentage has decreased. Um, what is the current market share of voluntary versus FDNY units? Do you know that? Roughly 60-40. Okay, so it's slightly, slightly less than... Yeah. Slightly more, actually. Well, the department will increase as we catch up with staffing. We can increase the number of municipal tours. Um, have any private ambulance tours been taken over in the past year? And do we anticipate this future year any tours being taken over? Have private ambulance, have the voluntaries taken over any of our municipal tours? No, no, uh, vice versa. Has the city taken over any voluntary there's, tours? There's one um, tour in the works of an, in Upper Manhattan that we will be absorbing. Um, the preliminary MMR indicates the last three years the percentage of cardiac arrest patients uh, revived has increased uh, to 13 percent to 35 percent, which is certainly a fantastic number. W what does the department attribute that to, and is it luck or is it uh, a change of tactics or uh, good work? I think it's better capture of data. I, I really, uh, I wouldn't think that it's luck or skill. I think we just did a better job of capturing it. The, uh, the FY 2020 budget included $43 million over two fiscal years for fly car expansion. The expansion was to extend throughout all of the Bronx with 27 total fly cars. Uh, can you just tell us what the status of the program of that is and are there 27 fly cars? There are not yet uh, 27 fly cars. What we did now, there are um, fly cars and PRUs, which are do a similar task, non-transporting paramedic vehicles. Uh, fly cars are staffed by an, uh, an officer and a paramedic, and PRUs are, sta are staffed by two paramedics. I believe currently in service we have certainly less than how many fly cars? Ten fly cars, three PRUs, Thir total of 13. Is the goal to expand it outside of the Bronx as well at some point? I think once we get it fully implemented in the Bronx and can evaluate how it worked, uh, we can see if, that's, if it's worth expanding. So I understand EMS will, is going to change the number of divisions from six to nine. W what is the rationale behind that and what, what, is, the, what is the goal? Well, that's being evaluated right now based on uh, the need for you know increase in supervision in the number of this a thousand in this administration um, we've added a thousand in headcount in EMS over the past six years um, and we've not added divisions so we're evaluating the need because each division is now supervising many more units. Um, the 
big issue with uh, obviously FDNY EMS is pay parity, and the council has been uh, fairly clear, um, not just this committee, but other council committees uh, and the organization as a body uh, calling for pay parity. Uh, what is the department doing to increase you know, EMS members' wages, um, and does the department support the uh, rising wages of EMS workers? Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the council for appreciating the value of our, our EMS people, and uh, for that we are grateful. Uh, the department uh, negotiations have just begun now between EMS unions and the city. Uh, as you know, the department doesn't have the ability to uh, unilaterally do that. That would be quite dangerous in the city. I think all of our commissioners that value our workers so much would want our people at the very top of the pyramid. In our case, it would be justified, of course, but uh, certainly I wish, hope the negotiations go well and will not be disappointed if our EMS unions are able to secure uh, a contract that recognizes the work that they do. So I, I, we are all aware that every uh, EMT has met uh, certain certifications and qualifications, but as a general rule of thumb, is experience uh, better? Does experience lead to better outcomes? I, I don't know if we've ever measured that. I think every, every person that comes out of our academy from day one, and it goes for the fire academy also, is ready to do their job. I think a good measure of that is um, we have our unit of the month every, every month. Last month I met with four young men. Among them, the senior person had less than three years, and this was a group recognized for doing exemplary work um, in EMS. So, uh, of course, experience is a factor. Many of the people that come into VMS have been EMTs before, before they entered the department. Everyone other than our trainees have EMT certification. So while experience is, uh, is a valuable factor, uh, I think we can be safely assume that the folks that are on our ambulances know what they're doing and will treat the patients that they have come in contact with aggressively and uh, successfully. A, a fifth year EMT makes about $50,000. If they're promoted to a first year firefighter, their base salary becomes $44,000. Um, do, they, do they lose the increase and take the lower pay? Yes. yes. Okay. Well, that was a question we had in the committee we didn't know the answer to. I mean, more, uh, really didn't know the answer. Um, just. Briefly about the, uh, the uh, collection rate from individuals in city care. Um, l last year, since the announcement of NYC Care, we spoke about the uncertainty around the program uh, and collections from uninsured. It's been rolled out in the Bronx, and the program has more than 1,300 enrollees. So w what is the collection rate uh, from individuals with NYC Care? Um, with, are you talking about transports that our EMS does for ambulances? Yes. So historically, the ambulance collection rate for those who either we cannot identify insurance for or do not, in fact, have insurance is around 20% of our payer mix. For the other 80%, um, either through government-sponsored insurance or private insurance, um, we collected probably close to 95%. Um. Can you just, just to stay with EMS then for one more second, can you just talk about how the uh, EMS evaluates performance, uh, how we track patient outcomes? You know, we had that cardiac number, um, but w what other metrics exist out there to track the performance of EMTs and ambulance units? Uh, the Office of Medical Affairs has a significant oversight over EMS, and they do quality assurance on a regular basis. But statistically, is the outcome of EMTs improving or um, f failing in more cases? Can you repeat that? So if we are tracking the uh, outcomes and keeping statistics on the outcomes, is the rate of good outcomes growing and the rate of bad outcomes decreasing? 
I think it's remained fairly consistent. We'd have to look at the statistics with the doctors, but I believe it's remained consistent over time. So just turning to capital, um, what are the department's biggest capital projects uh, and what are the department's biggest capital challenges? I think like all the other agencies, the, the challenges in capital is securing enough commitment funding and also the length of the process to bring a project to fruition. Um, some of the big projects that we are funded for is the, the large project to convert all of our conduit um, underneath the surface of the street to fiber optics, which will greatly improve the dispatching time and allow for a lot of improvements in the firehouse and EMS stations. Um, we also have a, a large project just underway, which is a several part project. Right now the funding is available for Fort Totten upgrade of the infrastructure out there. It's a $50 million project that's mainly for the EMS Academy. We obviously just we opened the, the new Rescue 2 quarters. Um, we're working on uh, a new quarters for Engine 268 and an EMS Station 17. And then there are some technology projects um, for uh, Channel 16 exp um, um, expansion for the radio system and a new uh, uh, fires project that will help automate the billion inspection program. Uh, and, and what other uh, capital projects are on the horizon in the agency's long-term needs that, that you've assessed? The largest areas are you know, always going to be in the construction area, a multi-component work for firehouses and EMS stations, and, the sec and, mo and just as important in the technology area as we, as the Department of Public Safety, as we move into a more secure networks and things of that nature, um, and going to private networks, and all of that expansion will require additional capital funds. We're in discussions with OMB on that right now. So um, when firefighters are exposed to carcinogens and are um, stuck to their equipment and gear, what is the department's policy and procedure for washing uh, their bunker gear? Well, currently the department, uh, well, we just, we were cleaning gear once a year. I think we're now up twice a year, which is the NFPA standard for cleaning bunker gear for firefighters. As a rule of thumb, though, getting carcinogens off of clothes is probably a good thing. What's that? Getting carcinogens off of clothing would probably be a good thing in general. I would think that's a good thing. So the frequency of washing the gear would be uh, beneficial to the members. Which is why we've increased it from once a year to twice a year, yes. Has the department explored perhaps a, a pilot program of outfitting certain uh, houses with uh, their own washing machines? And is there a, um, a, a capital commitment or a estimate of the cost for that program? Do we, I, I think we've We're looking at certainly looking at it. We're not committed to doing that, to putting machines in every firehouse. Um, but it's something that's being reviewed as a, right now we have an outside vendor do that. Whether we'd want to switch to do it in each individual firehouse has not been uh, evaluated fully, no. What is the cost uh, of the, the vendor services per year, roughly? To ex um, I do have that number. I'd have to, offhand, I, have, I, I, could, I could find it for you. Um, give, me a, mm -hmm. give me a moment. If, if it's possible, could you uh, get back to the committee with uh, the cost of the uh, operation to clean the bunker gear as well as a, um, a cost of implementing and installing washing machines in you know, a, a pilot program, however you would think optimal, whether it be uh, in one house per division or battalion or whether it would be one battalion or something overall? We would just be interested in knowing the cost of that uh, and perhaps uh, pushing it through. Yeah, the pilot programs, we're looking at three options. One is increasing the contract with the vendor. The other is locating washers and dryers at Randall's Island, and the other is doing it in a firehouse. So we'll get you the costs on those three, and then operations will decide which one we're going to pilot first. Okay, thank you. Uh, so y in your testimony, Commissioner, you, you mentioned the diversity of the most recent class, um, and the numbers were an improvement uh, over the past do we have any estimate of why that was the case? Is there something that was done differently? Uh, and can we continue to duplicate it or, or increase? Well, uh, you know, we have Commissioner Noonan here. Uh, 
about re how it happened, the department put a tremendous amount of effort into recruiting before the last test. So more than half of the folks that took that test identified as people of color. So what we have now going forward, what we anticipate in each and every class, they should be similar to what this, the last class that graduated, in which 37%, I think is what I, uh, what I stated, identified that way. So each class will, uh, we've just about in the last few years doubled the percentage of people of color in the department. So and you, we're continuing you, along that line because of the recruitment of those candidates who took and passed the test and will be hired in subsequent classes. And, and you, you mentioned the department in, in its official capacity attends meetings with um, the department's different uh, ethnic and religious groups, and you know, we, we certainly support all of that. Uh, we're wondering, you know, what, what actually happens at the meetings? Is it, is it uh, are there round tables? Is there a lot of feedback from these organizations? And is that feedback uh, then um, turned into recruitment policy? I think the various formats at this at the CDIO's meetings with affiliated organizations, is that what you're uh, uh, talking about? Yeah. Some of them we bring in people, have presentations uh, on best practices. Um, there is some roundtable discussions as to uh, requests from folks in various organizations uh, affiliated with the department, but it's it's a chance for people to uh, meet with this great variety. I said there's 40 different affiliated organizations within the department um, to meet, to get to know them, and it's made the department more accessible, more inclusive. Um, it's an edu great educational value to those that attend, and we will uh, continue to do it on a monthly basis, that formalized uh, meeting. And uh, just a final topic uh, before I turn it over to uh, Council Member Brannon. Um, what is the department doing to decrease uh, both uniform uh, and civilian overtime spending? Steve? I think I've been testifying before the council for many, many years, and overtime is obviously always a large uh, challenge for the, the agency. Um, we are seeing a, 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 a slight reduction in this year's projected overtime, mainly on the fire side, uh, because as we continue to hire up, um, obviously having more full-time staff reduces overtime. Um, with respect to EMS, um, given the challenges of staffing right now, over time is high. We expect as staffing in increases, that will go down as well. So um, we are taking additional steps on monitoring over time, and that's being headed up by the chief of department, and we're seeing reductions in some of the major areas of overtime spending um, in the administrative and support areas that has occurred in the last 12 months. Yeah. Yes, we'll do it. Um, that is all the questions I have. I will turn it over to Council Member Brandon for questions. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Commissioner, it's great again to hear you support uh, the fight for uh, EMS pay parity. I know if you could snap your fingers and make it happen, I, I am confident that you would. Um, has there been any talk about increasing uh, staffing and funding for the EMS Academy? Yeah, we have. and. Uh, we're in the process now of increasing capacity so that our EMS classes can move from a, a, a 180 maximum to 240. And that's all based on some of the capital improvements being made, st staffing in increases in training um, and expansion into an, another building actually, which is going forward. So um, definitely gives us a capacity to hire more and to graduate folks uh, at a higher level. Is there, I mean, is there an ask for additional funding for the, for the EMS Academy this year? Was it Steve? I think we um, There is a, an ask that's being evaluated by OMB at present. Okay. Um, and then another issue for me that is important, just because I hear it all the time from, from uh, men and women on the job is is about the fifth firefighter. Is there still internal talk about um, permanently putting back the fifth the fifth man? 
Um, not that I'm aware of. I know the union had negotiated uh, 20 additional, 25 firefighter units. Um, the UFA is not yet in negotiations with their next, for their next contract. I don't know what their plans are, if they're planning to seek additional staffing, but um, we'll see. I think they're potentially waiting for an outcome of the PBA. Uh, they have yet to sit down and negotiate the UFA. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. We have been joined by Council Member Maisel uh, and Council Member Cabrera. And Council Member Cabrera has a question. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. Welcome, Commissioner, and to all the staff. Um, can you uh, just have a one kind of a big question here? What is the policy uh, with FDNY and Con, Con Edison, uh, Con Ed, regarding manhole fires and false alarm? Does the FDNY have information on any? financial agreements uh, between, with Con Ed, specifically to recoup costs associated with responses to manhole fires, particularly regarding false alarms? No, um, and I'm not aware that there's a f manhole fire false alarm issue. And the department does, especially uh, in the winter or in periods of uh, excessive heat respond to manhole fires, but I don't think we get too many false alarms from manhole fires. Do, com do commercial uh, buildings uh, get charged for false alarms? There's a, uh, automatic alarms. If you have an excessive number of automatic false alarms on your automatic alarm system, there is a charge, there is a fine, yes. Okay. Do you know how much that is? I'm just curious. The Any fines system? are set by the um, ECB, that's part of oath, and they may vary, to, um, the, um, but there's also a, a period where you can come back into compliance. So we do give you an opportunity to correct. Usually the systems have some maintenance issues. Okay. Thank you so much. Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Maisel, any questions? No. At this time we have no, oh, I'm being overruled. Um, how long will it take to implement the fly car expansion? Uh, I'll have to get back to you on that. I, I don't know. It's, it's, um, so you're saying possibly the end of fiscal year 21? And then finally on overtime, can you provide the committee a breakdown of uh, funding by source, uh, city versus non-city specifically? If you don't have that now, would you be able to provide the committee with that? Uh, I think we can, yes. Thank you. Right now, the expected spending in overtime um, total is um, approximately $337 million, of which um, we're projecting $13 million, which would be through Homeland, generally Homeland Security funding. Thank you. Jack's and the $750,000 is the cost for the cleaning of the, uh, uh, second cleaning of the bunker here. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Asked and answer. I'm gonna see if Jack has any more questions. He's been here six months, he's already the boss, you know. <laughs> thank you guys, I appreciate it. So the next uh, panel will be uh, Vincent Variali and Oren Barzali. And uh, the writing is sloppy, please excuse me, uh, Bryce Jacob.
Bryce, I'm not going to lie. Uh, the two gentlemen next to you are uh, frequent guests of this committee. <laughs> you are not, so you will go first. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the honor. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Bruce Jacobs, Coalition of the Rockaways and Southeast Queens, fighter for the Rockaways and Southeast Queens, U.S. Navy veteran, 9-11 first responder, and medical and religious freedom. Um, I have a, one thing with this budget that I don't like. First of all, there's restrictions on people doing their job, because I'm all for the fire department getting their jobs, getting the jobs done. My cousin, and I worked with the fire department with the Transit Authority for over 30 years, to put a restriction on overtime when you can't even get people that could do this job, because this job of fire department is not like, you know, a job, regular job. You have to want to do it. Now you have also on this budget that you're breaking down. I know it's not, you guys are going to go politically correct and everything, because, you know, I represent the Redfern City Housing and all that also. The, the idea that you're trying to give jobs just by the thought of what a person is, unless you're really qualified. You can't cut down the qualifications just to get your paper trail on, you know, hiring. Fire department, a fireman, EMS, I'm all for it. EMS should get a first crack at getting promoted because they're already in the fire department. But, you know, you, the, the, the other kind of hiring, you're talking about spending, what the cutting down the full-time materials and uniform and all that, you really can't do that with, with the fire department. In a city like this, which we're already in big problems where we can't walk the streets safely because of special rules that, you know, was adopted in Albany, we don't need to have our heroes restricted on making, over, on making money. They work hard for their money, and they deserve every penny that they get, because not everybody could run into a fire. And even if you want the job, you have to go through heavy qualifications for that. And it's a job that it's necessary, because if you don't, if you don't have these things, how are you going to learn, go, want to go into a fire? Fire is like, you know, firemen, you know, even EMS, those jobs, you got to be heroes. Now, on the, on the idea of spending, where I see, of course, they're going to get fringe benefits to take that kind of job. The only reason that you would be a firefighter or even an EMS is for the benefits. And if you're going to put the benefits down as a budget, I really don't see how that should be part of a budget because that's the, how are you going to get qualified guys and guys who even want the job if you don't want to give them good benefits. Now it says overtime uniform. Okay, on that part of the budget, yeah, maybe they should give more for the civilian overtime because, you know, there's no, I see that the civilians don't get nothing. The civilians are also heroes, you know, they work in that department, they deserve a break. Now with the fifth fifth firefighter, yeah, they should, you know, it's good to have a fifth firefighter. However, if you could get more safety for them in any other ways, that's another, you know, that's a questionable uh, thing to think about because, you know, modern times, but the safety of our firefighters is the most important thing. The EMS, like I said, they should get first crack I don't know how their hiring's working, but when you have things down on a budget that's breaking down by race, by groups, by all that, no, you can't do that. Yes, they should hire all different people equally on the same thing. There's no such a thing as giving a job if people are not qualified. In this budget, there should be more money given for education, 
for education to help people to be more qualified to do these things. Because people have to be trained, not just the, not the nine week or the six month, whatever it is, you know, going to the school, the fire department. But once again, like I said, these guys should get whatever they deserve, with all the money and all the, for their budget. Yes, it should be watched because, you know, I see the civilian overtime is no good. You put in the fringe benefits as a benefit, additional gross pay, you know, stuff like that. Okay, you know, you could look at it, but you can't really. And now you have the response, the response time with the emerging, the EMS, the EMS is a real heroes. They're not even looked upon as nothing. You know, a lot of people don't, they disregard them, but if it wasn't for EMS, we wouldn't be, you know, emergencies, we'd be in trouble. The EMS response time is beautiful. You really can't get better than that. If they're complaining about that, there's really no possible way that you could get better. They're doing the best job they possibly could do. And, and, the, and the New York City, the last thing I'm gonna say, has to stop caring about violations and all this stuff when you got guys walking the streets with no bail, that you can't walk up your street safely and nobody could get arrested while we're sitting here, the law-abiding citizens, with our life in danger and our police officers can't even do nothing. So how are our firefighters gonna continue? Thank you very much. I'll just add one thing, the violations that the commissioner and the staff are talking about were typically for intentional arsons. That's the discovery, so I don't want people burning down the buildings. Uh, next, uh, we will hear from Warren. Good morning, Chairman Borelli, and good morning, committee chairpeople. The proposed additions to the 2020 FTNY EMS budget are to be applauded. The capital investment to the infrastructure is long overdue. The realignment of the divisions will make daily operations more manageable, adding positions at EMD, Emergency Medical Dispatch, for quality assurance, will improve triage of 911 requests for assistance. However, all these do not address the reality of the situation we are facing. The EMS providers handle 82% of the call volume with just 14% 14, 14 of the fire department budget while fire suppressions handles 18% of the call volume with 70% of the budget. It is imperative that the budget allocation be aligned with the overall needs of the 911 response system. At a recent labor management meeting, one of our chiefs admitted that there was only one fully staffed EMS station in the entire system. The three other major issues facing the EMS systems are an unfunded headcount, the inability to retain those providers already trained, and pay scales incompatible with other services in the overall 911 system. Increasing the ability of the academy to train larger numbers of new employees is essentially superfluous, as nearly 80% of them will leave for better paying jobs. On average, within four years, most of them leave. Other five-year first responders are paid $85,000 a year. A five-year EMT is paid $49,000. This disparity is the reason the department is unable to retain personnel in the titles performing the bulk of the responses by the FDNY. Unless the pay scale issues are urgently addressed, hiring, training, and equipment hordes of people is nothing more than throwing good money after bad in the hope that spending even more money in the same manner on these problematic issues in their presumably futile hope of fixing it. That's my testimony. I, will, uh, I just want to add a few comments once Vinny is done with his. Sure, I, I have a question for both of you as well. Okay. Um, Vin? Yeah, thank you. Uh, in our prepared statement, I just want to point out a couple of things that were mentioned in, uh, that in the report and both that were stated. Um, first thing I want to bring up is uh, the expansion of the Fort Totten EMS Academy. I think it's great that they 
allocate over $50 million to expand the academy, to hire more uh, members to become, for staffing. We'd certainly need the staffing. However, <laughs> to, to add more staffing without addressing the retention problem is, is just making, uh, it's turning the academy into a mill, churning out people who are not gonna stay here. Uh, we need to address the retention problem by increasing salaries and giving people a career here. That's what saves lives. I've heard the commissioner say about, uh, gave a brief mention about uh, experience and how it would be good and had no knowledge of uh, whether or not it would prov provide a bigger difference because our members that are here today save lives. And that's true, they do. They work hard, they save lives. But we have seen the research. This isn't just something I'm making up. It, it's, it demonstrates that ex there's a correlation between experience and, and positive patient outcomes. To spend over $50 million just to create a mill to churn out more new recruits, that's something the academy is never gonna be able to produce, experience. You need people on this job with more than five years on the job, more than three years on the job, who have the experience to provide that positive patient outcome and to save lives. And we need to start investing in EMS as a life-saving resource that it is. And, and that's something that I think needs to be uh, stated to OMB, to the mayor's office. They need to start admitting that and start addressing that problem. Uh, the other issue I wanna bring up is the fly cars. Uh, there is two separate uh, um, models being introduced, well, barely one, but one is the fly car, which is a supervisor and a paramedic, and the other one is the PRU, which stands for Paramedic Response Unit. That's two paramedics. I believe there's only three of those units uh, uh, currently working. I think that's the model we need to go with. I think the fly car, where there's one supervisor and one paramedic, is a flawed model. We have seen it, it's been in operation over three years. I don't know how much more evidence they need to tell them that it's not working. It's increased response times in the Bronx, and it's dangerous, because by increasing response times, people aren't getting the necessary emergency medical uh, services they need. Um, the, the supervisors, the, the lieutenants who are on those fly cars can't do their job as an officer. They are, their workload has tripled, and they're not able to supervise. And, and they're being held accountable to do that, that job. So let's look at this for a minute. We are grossly underpaid, grossly understaffed, triple our workload, and we expect positive results. Does that make any sense whatsoever? Hmm. It makes no sense. And it's in the, the sad part about this, this isn't a corporation that's gonna fail and go bankrupt. This is people's lives we're talking about. People are going to die. People's lives are already in danger because of it. Um, if they want to pursue the PRU model, they should do so. But the fly car model needs to end. They need to let officers be officers and let them supervise. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> do each of your respective unions support the uh, change of division number from six to nine? I believe it was originally five, and, and the intention is to increase the divisions. I only seen one change so far, but I don't really see a value in that. If anything, what they need to do is increase the amount of EMS stations, decompress some of the stations we have, and increase the amount of stations, because we're already overflowing. You have some stations that are they're, they're crammed in like sardines. Um, I, I really don't see a major value or a difference in, in creating more divisions. I mean, it couldn't hurt, but for me, it wouldn't be a number one priority that would make a, a, a real difference. Lauren, do you want to add to that, and do you want to say anything else? Uh, I just want to add a few things to what Vinny said, because uh, he's 100% right, and experience does matter. What, what you read in a textbook is different than what you see in real life. If it's your first time seeing somebody having a stroke or a heart attack, you're not going to know it until you experience it a few, a few times. And your, your reaction each time will be quicker to recognize it. So when they tell you it doesn't make a difference, it's, it's blatantly false. Uh, and lives are at risk without having this knowledge and experience. Uh, as far as uh, having more divisions, uh, it's not going to improve response times. It's not going to improve uh, any of our issues that we have. Uh, it will give more promotional opportunities maybe, uh, but that's about it. Uh, 
as far as Vinny saying we need more stations, he's right. I mean, we addressed the lockers issue here last year, so their, their resolve was we'll cut them in half. Our members now have half lockers, so more people can have lockers. Um, the Stan Island question that you asked about another station. Um, yeah, we need another station in Stan Island. It takes a unit sometimes 15 to 20 minutes to get to their response area. It's one of the biggest boroughs to get to one end to the other. It's not, even with lights and siren can take you 20, 30 minutes. So I, I don't understand how they're saying that it's not needed. Um, you also question if we've given any or if we've taken any units and they, met and, and they mentioned that they took over a unit in uh, Manhattan North. That's incorrect. They pulled Manhattan, um, Presbyterian pulled out a paramedic unit out of the system in Washington Heights. They don't have the manpower, so what they did was they took a Midtown ALS unit and moved them up to Washington Heights. So now Manhattan Midtown has one less paramedic unit. And this is what they do all, all the time. They shuffle people around. We're not increasing our head count. They said they added 1,000 people. We lost 12, 1,300 people. They just replaced them. We're still at a shortfall. So by expanding our academy, it's putting on a Band-Aid on an artery that's bleeding, that's not fixing it. You can make our academy handle 1,000 people. Those 1,000 people would leave just as quick as the current people are leaving. It's not, it's not fixing the issue that we have. How is OMB not seeing all this wasted money? It is beyond comprehension. We're training thousands of people. We're putting hundreds of, of trainees in our academy to train these people, and they're still not staying. In our last class, as they're training, three of them were called into NYPD Academy. They packed up their stuff and they, and they walked out. While in training, anything that comes their way, they're leaving. The overtime. We have a 40% overtime cap that was negotiated. Because it's so high, they increased it to 50% earlier this month, in February, I believe. Yes. Um, if, if you have um, any questions, no, thank you. Uh, we have been joined by Council Member Deutsch, and uh, if there are any further questions or anyone would like to testify, now is your chance to flail your arms or something. If not, the committee is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on. I take it back. I, t I think I could do that. I have to start again? No. Are we clear? Or? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. I'm sorry. I apologize. Thank you. And Josefina, you, whenever you would like to start, you may begin. Good morning. Josefina Sanfiliu from Latinas Against FDNY Cuts. I wasn't going to speak until I noticed that UFA and UFOA have no representation here to represent the firefighters who are the people being discussed. For example, if you're gonna have washing machines to remove carcinogens from bunker gear, once a year is stunning, twice a year is better, but who is going to be handling carcinogen material is going to be one person or each person is going to be putting their product into a washer and dryer and where is the water the rinse water going to go and where is the ventilation of a dryer going to go into the neighborhood compared to a facility of a vendor which might be specialized um, so those are issues that I sincerely wish the unions either one had been present to address besides the point of view of the department. 
that's my comment for the day. Thank you, and it is lovely to see you as always. And Thank now you. I officially adjourn.